I want to thank General Thomas for uh, doing this. We're going to just jump right on in because we only have about 20 minutes with you here today. So when you think about the future, new weapons technology, is the military thinking big enough? Or is it kind of just trying to do what it's done for years with just adding some new technology into it? Well, thanks for that easy question to start right out the gate, uh, Marcus. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Amir Hussein and the Spark Cognition team for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, this is my first foray into, into public speaking since retiring six months ago after 39 years of service. So uh, wish me well. I'm the only thing between you and the after party. So what's the worst that can happen? Um, so quick answer to your question. No, we're not moving big or fast enough, in my opinion. And yes, we are, again, in my opinion, iterating uh, on what we already do, what we already have, instead of more aggressively and, and kind of more creatively uh, thinking what the art of the possible is. Now, I say that uh, acknowledging that I was part of the problem. Um, uh, it's easy to sit outside the Department of Defense and disparage it for bureaucracy and, and traits that it, it has in spades. Uh, but I, I actually contributed to part of the, the challenge from, uh, from a Special Operations co a Command standpoint. So of the many if I coulda, woulda do-overs that I will never get, I wish I had moved more aggressively in this space. I wish I had not created headspace in my organization. We picked up some really daunting missions while I was there. The focal point, the, the lead for the Department of Defense for countering weapons of mass destruction, the lead for information operations, and we automatically uh, added uh, uh, heads, you know, head count, uh, end strength to the command. And I wish that we had been a little more constrained in, in our approach there. So again, I'm not, I'm part of the problem, I, and any criticism I, I'm leveling uh, towards the department is intended to be critical or, or constructive. Um, how did we get here? And I think that's kind of key uh, to acknowledge why there is this latency. First of all, um, I think we've been lulled into the nature of the war, the longest war in the history of the United States that we've been involved in for the last 18 years. And that's not to say that it has not been a testbed for some extraordinary technological integration. We, we have integrated at a rapid pace. We thought very rapid, not rapid enough now as I look in retrospect. Um, and it has played out in really, really enhanced uh, tactics, techniques, and procedure may have contributed into the recent uh, success in Syria to get uh, al-Baghdadi. Um, we have been slow to acknowledge the rise of peer competitors. And again, I'm not being hypercritical here. Um, the department was uh, a manifestation of our U.S. approach to uh, what we now call uh, emer or, uh, uh, enduring threats in the form of China and Russia, that as recently as three to four years ago, our U.S. policy was to not refer to them as adversaries. Uh, or threats, so we've only recently flipped that kind of uh, reflection on them. Um, but really, I think the bigger thing is a lack of imagination and a lack of urgency. I have heard that the, right, the race, the run to AI is an existential race and potentially an existential threat. And it sounds alarmist coming from a military guy, so I would play it to be maybe more palatable that if you don't want to consider it as an existential threat, think of it as an existential opportunity but you would think existential would drive a level of urgency and aggressiveness that would be almost fever pitched. Manhattan Project's been thrown around with it, et cetera. You don't see that. I've not seen that, uh, certainly in the department spaces, um, and, and we really could and should uh, pick that up. So how do you change this very quickly? Um, earlier today it was acknowledged we have some inherent challenges. Uh, our DOD bureaucracy, specifically in acquisition space, has to change. We have to adapt. You saw Will Roper up here today. I'm, I'm somewhat sanguine. Uh, that we have some extraordinary acquisition directors now in place. If anybody can change it, it, it will be them, uh, but they've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we can move at the pace of technology. Uh, perhaps even harder is something that I discovered when we, at the tail end of my command, we invited some, uh, some venture capitalists and some uh, AI thought-provoking industry leaders uh, to come under our tent to visit Special Operations Command. We specifically sent them out to the Pacific to see our operations there. And they came back universally jazzed uh, by the talent in our formation. So I'm always, a, I'm always pleased when they, they know that we still are getting the best and brightest. But I could tell they were pulling a punch when we had the outbrief. And I said, what is it? And finally, one of the lead venture capitalists said, hey, look, your people clearly get the transformational uh, capability of AI, um, but your IT systems are so arcane, so anachronistic, you may never be able to make the transition. And so I, I acknowledge that, and in fact, uh, one venture capitalist continues to tweet, I saw his tweet the other day, that his advice to me on the way out was, if I was a peer competitor and didn't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, I would merely put six to ten bureaucrats inside your system 
and design the IT system that you currently have just to hobble you. So think, think, of, think of that. Uh, my response to him on Twitter was, thanks, it hurt before, it continues to hurt. Um, what, can, what can we do you know, in a more positive sense to get after this? This is the time for grand strategy in the sense of how are we going to compete short of conflict, and worst case, if conflict comes upon us, how are you going to win against the adversaries that I've already identified? Um, it will drive a reconsideration in my mind, a, a, a revolutionary reconsideration in my mind in, as far as platforms, but more importantly, it'll drive a transformation in the people uh, that the department needs going forward. And, and folks who should feel threatened is everybody who is manned in a manned platform, pilots, ship drivers, et cetera, and the folks who we might be attracting more uh, in the future, data scientists, software engineers, et cetera, but we have, to, we have to make that transformation as part of our adjustment. So long answer, sorry. So, so you, you were a little harsh on yourself earlier on, but one thing that was mentioned by John in the uh, introduction, you did create a, a chief data officer position at SOCOM. Talk a little bit about why you did that and talk about some of the early lessons learned and possibly could the other, you know, other parts of the military benefit from this. Okay, uh, some of you have read this because I acknowledged it publicly. I didn't realize that it was gonna get out in the public space officially. Uh, but I can't claim any sort of uh, visionary epiphany on my own. Uh, when I assumed command of SOCOM in 2016, uh, we were a very busy command. I used to joke, you know, we're special operations and business is good. I meant national security might, might have been challenged, but I would, I would acknowledge that while I had a fascination and interest in AI, it was back burner. I did not think it was going to be, you know, a prominent area of focus for me as the SOCOM commander. I thought, you know, we'll, we'll work it as, as we are working at the tactical edge. Uh, but the epiphany was provided to me by a guy named Eric Schmidt. Some of you may know him, you know, Google, Google Alphabet, et cetera. Uh, came to visit SOCOM in my first two months in command. And uh, as Eric Schmidt's inclined to do, he, he decided that he needed to give me a report card on the way out. He had been there for all the 24 hours. And uh, don't, uh, I've had too many people come up and apologize to me for the way it might have been delivered to me. Actually, it was the kick in the shins that I, that I needed, that I benefited from. And he said, General, uh, your report card on SOCOM, you have extraordinary people. I thought, check, if you took nothing else away, incredible talent here. Uh, you prototype pretty effectively, and I thought, good, we were, we've been failing fast and prototyping long before business book, that I ever read about it in a business book, but he said, you absolutely, absolutely, and then very colorfully, you fill in the blanks in terms of applied machine learning and artificial intelligence. I thought, I wonder where this guy is going with it. He said, I know you live in a very complex world, but if I got under your tent for one day, I think I could simplify everything to a simple up-down switch with advanced algorithms and quantum computing. And as I acknowledged, and, and, and I, I'd said it publicly on stage, so it of course got out in the press, I was ready to boot him right out of the suburb. We were right in a suburban on Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa. I was ready to kick him right out the door because I thought that was the most arrogant thing I, I think I've heard of to, to break down the, the complexity that we were living in, weapons of mass destruction, counterterrorism, et cetera. But as I paused for a moment to think about it, it dawned on me, he's absolutely right. I wasn't even planning on making this a priority, but we're swimming in data that I can't throw enough analysts at, and we have superb analysts, but we literally couldn't keep up with the, with the, uh, the amount of type of, uh, of, of information, specifically in publicly available information that we hadn't even had an analytic effort geared towards before. Uh, so the, the immediate realization was we gotta get there. Uh, I get credit for hiring a chief data officer, and, and truthfully, again, no, no big epiphany there. Almost everybody was talking about the need for a chief data officer in their organization, whether it was in the public or private sector. Um, and we, we had a particularly talented guy who had worked Maven, you heard that mentioned earlier today, had been one of our senior analysts, just a brilliant guy who, 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 who just was self-taught. Therein lies one of the, the, the harder lessons learned I had, and it, it goes to how we man towards this mission in the future. It took us nine months to hire this individual, even when we said, by name, this is the individual we want, as our highly qualified expert because he uh, lacked quote unquote the academic credentials to do the job. He's been you know, exclaimed in every other circle since then as we've touched you know, this community as a national treasure, he's that good, but it took nine months to hire him. It took another nine months to hire anybody in his formation and uh, how do I know this? He was a direct report to me. So the, the only really enlightened thing that I think I get uh, credit for is hiring this guy and making him a direct report because he antagonized me about every day in a good way. Truthfully, I wish I had been more, more interactive with him because you know, his frustration is borne by the fact we're not moving fast enough and I didn't have the rhythm that, uh, that, that would have uh, you know, really informed me on that. Um, he, he quickly 
one, establish the relationship we needed across the board, but we identified the need to transform our workforce in a hurry, re-educate them and change us from AI admirers to AI practitioners. And so in a very forceful effort, uh, he, bundled our, he bundled our approaches. You heard earlier today that one of the wins in DOD has been predictive maintenance. I'd like to think we actually started that. Uh, we, we happened to have, we owned our data for our helicopter force, you know, the most specialized helicopter force on the planet, but a key being that we owned our data. It wasn't with some company that I had to fight to get it back, and so we were able to immediately go to a predictive maintenance approach that has been groundbreaking for us, but more importantly for DOD. And think of it, it's not the sexiest mission you can think of for, uh, for applied AI, but it, it played out in a big way early on and, and was a, a big win to get the force to acknowledge, here's what you could, should be doing across the spectrum. Um, so again, uh, some movement, but not fast enough. So we've been hearing, we've been hearing, pull, pulling that thread a little bit. We heard Dr. Roper talking earlier today uh, about you know bringing more commercial technology into into the military. Um, you know, there's been the high profile Project Maven, um, which SOCOM, uh, from what I understand, has has, benef has benefited from. But what are what are kind of the barriers though that that you're seeing to why this type of technology isn't being wider spread throughout the military? If I can pull the string on MAVEN just very quickly, uh, MAVEN played out here recently. So the effort in MAVEN, which we invested in fully early on, it was practical to what we were doing in terms of the counterterrorist mission, uh, has paid dividends already and I think still has uh, some dividends that we, we can derive from it. The interesting part was the MAVEN Google hiccup, which most of you are aware of that uh, at a point in time, uh, uh, you know, the part of the workforce at Google uh, was either unaware or not uh, at a point, you know, at that point, just not uh, supportive of the fact that Google was helping us in this project that they saw as killer drones. You know, they didn't need any more information than that. It's it's nefarious. It's it's evil. It's something we can't comprehend. The missed opportunity that, that again I shared with the department leadership uh, that I wish we had, and I would I would extend to this audience here, was what we were after. And I, I don't want to argue about the inevitability of conflict because that was part of the problem of. You know, war is not inevitable, and you, you, again, we could spend hours on that. But just in the off chance that we might go to war again, what we were looking for was the most precise application of artificial intelligence on you pick the platform, but because now people see it as hellfires coming off uh, a predator or a reaper, but it could be something later on that literally comes up and you know, buzzes in your face and identifies you as an enemy to the country and then does something, to, you know, something about that. But we were looking for the most precise application of, 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 of military uh, you know, power that's ever conceived with zero collateral damage. You know, again, for this public audience, it's worth emphasizing because I've read too many mis, you know, misconceptions uh, uh, on the type of war that we've been involved in and what we're pursuing. Our sine qua, qua non, and I can tell you from personal example, having authorized hundreds if not thousands of strikes, our sine qua non is zero collateral damage before we take a shot. We don't always get it right, 99 point something percent, and it's in that, in that realm, we do get it right, uh, but our going in criteria is zero collateral damage, and that's what we were after with the, uh, as we approached to, uh, you know, to the MAVEN project. Here's the, here's the inhibitors I think exist now, and interestingly, I'm, I'm, I'm now, I'm six months out, right, so I'm, I'm steeped in the, in the uh, private sector. I, don't, I can't even speak in the private sector intelligently yet. Um, but what I'm seeing is an interesting phenomenon in the private sector that I saw in the public sector, and I call it the, kind of the triple mantra. The triple mantra relative to AI is uh, you can waste a lot of money, there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. The second part is it's not ready for prime time, and the third is it'll disrupt our workforce. Let me pull those out very quickly. There are absolutely snake oil salesmen in the business. There are folks that can't productize, they can't deliver. Partly it's because you have companies that just say, give me that AI stuff, and they're not describing the problems they want and need to solve, and so there's a big gap there. But there, I think there's enough folks who are delivering this space now, you can tell who, who, who can deliver and who can't. The second part about uh, AI not ready for prime, or prime time has me wondering what alternative planet are you living on? The Borg, I use that term intentionally, knows more about you than you know about yourself. And we're talking about the companies that might have just yesterday picked up all your medical records, and know more about you, literally, than you know about yourself. Think of that, you can think of that as either evil or benign, but think of that in an adversary's hands in terms of what they're able to do with AI. So if, 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 the, if the competitive commercial space isn't compelling enough for you, I'm driven by the fact that our adversaries are absolutely getting reps every day for how to, how to leverage 
and enable this transformational capability. I mean, Vladimir Putin has been quoted as saying, who, he who gets it first wins, kind of very boldly out there. It com certainly compels me to, to think it's here and now and we, and we have to compete. The last one uh, to me, that the fact that it'll disrupt your workforce, is the most compelling uh, discussion we can have because I would say you're absolutely right. It's gonna disrupt your workforce. The longer you wait, the more irrelevant and the more vulnerable your workforce will be. And we've all read the descriptions, the economic forecasts of 50%, 70% of current jobs may change in the next five, 10, 15 years. If that isn't driving companies to a frenzy of transformational effort, I don't know what is, but many of them, and I'm, I'm dealing with a few of them now, are in the, it's a five year out phenomenon, I don't know how to do, you know, I, you know, I don't have to deal with it. If I were on their board, I'd be crushing you know, the CEO or replacing him or her if they had that kind of attitude instead of it's here now, we've got to change it, got to educate our workforce and we've got to get on to uh, this phenomenon today. And you have to have those brain numbing discussions every day. I, I admit that you know, most, most of, even some of the discussion here earlier today hurts my head to try and understand it as a 61 year old, but as senior leaders, you have to, you have to wrestle with that um, to, to actually accomplish anything in this space. Let's pivot real quick to, to we were talking about drones in there a little bit, and um, a few a few months back there was the cr cruise missile and drone attack in Saudi Arabia, an oil production facility there. How big a moment is that in terms of uh, what the future of warfare might hold? It, I, I think it's a huge moment. Now, again, it lasted 50, it had its 15 minutes of fame. Uh, we had a lot of who struck John. My first reaction, it's still unresolved, is how did we not see that coming? As massive as that attack was, and with the billions of dollars we have spent in that geographic space with partners, how did we get surprised? Again, if you have that answer, please see me afterwards because I'm, I'm still in search of it. I'm, I'm more frustrated by the fact that this had precedent. Two to three years ago, I was on the outskirts of Mosul, Iraq. Mosul was my hometown from uh, September 07 to December 08. I was a one star uh, with 1st Armored Division there, so I'd, I, I mean, I have an abiding affinity for that historic town which is now flattened in both the ISIS occupation and the, uh, and the subsequent reconquest. But we were on the phase of moving into Mosul. And that day when I visited our guys, uh, it, it was pretty remarkable because I can always remember the Iraqis called it the Day of the Drones. Sounds very melodramatic, right? But on that day, with air superiority, so nothing at high altitude that was gonna bother us or that, or that would interfere with our ground operations. On that day, the adversary with commercial off-the-shelf quadcopters launched 70 to 80 separate uh, sorties of, of quadcopters with little 40 millimeter grenades attached to them in a kind of field expedient fashion with a paras little parachute. So it was like a shuttlecock that would come down inside you or on top of you. 70 something over the course of 24 hours, 12 at one time, and it paralyzed the Iraqis as they were trying to retake this city because we had no answer. An absolutely asymmetric you know, uh, you know, counter by the enemy underneath our air superiority. So yet you had precedence for this. In fact, we came back, as I talked to, to your question, some of the major municipalities, our question was, how, how, how can you see this? This could fly against any sports venue, any, you pick the major assembly of people in the country here and absolutely paralyze, if not do something worse about it. And, and, and the reality is there was a big rush to detect and defend against these, uh, you know, these capabilities, a, a latent uh, effort to operationalize them. In fact, in my, in my uh, uh, group in Special Operations Command, the question was asked, why are we on the defensive here? Why aren't we using quadcopters more offensively? Interestingly, and you know the answer to this, who makes most of the uh, competitive quadcopters in the world? The big concern was we're just feeding another adversary and they're getting all the data while we're, while we're uh, running you know, in, in this lane, so some hesitancy there. But we, but we were really flummoxed by the whole uh, drone experience. To me, it's, it's part of the bigger phenomenon right now, the conflation of technology that is such an opportunity for us going forward. And think of everything unmanned. And, and, and again, much like AI, where I can't see anything that it doesn't apply to, I can't see anything that we could not shouldn't go unmanned, where the, where the real benefit or one of the real benefits will be the reduction of one of, one of the United States' greatest vulnerability. What do we, to our credit, put the highest value on? Human beings and not having human casualties. Well, if you push a force out there that is mostly unmanned and that's your attack surface, I think you have a decided advantage and maybe even the, the best possible deterrent going forward. But we have to think, I think, in that, in that mindset, instead of automatically going to some fixation on Skynet because we saw a movie where, where it all went bad. Um, again, I don't want to come off as, you know, in terms of negative criticism when reality is I am 
hugely optimistic about the opportunity that we have right now, uh, but I am a little bit concerned in terms of the pace and the speed that we're approaching the, uh, the challenge. So we are exactly out of time right then. So please join me in uh, thanking the general for joining us. Yeah.